Okay, two monks were traveling down a muddy road after a heavy rain when they came upon a lovely young girl in a silk kimono who was unable to cross the road because of the mud. Well, the older monk said, come on, girl, and he picked her up in his arms and carried her to the other side. Well, seeing this, the younger monk was speechless until later that night he said to his elder, we monks are not to go near females, especially young lovely ones. It's too dangerous. Why would you do that? And the older monk replied, I left the girl on the other side of the road. Why are you still carrying her? Well, this parable goes to a fundamental aspect of human nature in that sometimes we hold on to ideas so tightly that we fail to respond positively to new realities. The older monk had no attachments. He was able to act in the moment, while the younger monk was so attached to his monastic ideas that he couldn't see that the girl just needed help. Now, is it me or is there a really good vibe in here? Well, we're born, most of us, with the instinct to read a room. It's the cues are sometimes obvious, but sometimes they're so subtle that we've invented phrases like, there's a really good vibe in here. And like many things that we intuitively know, there is scientific research that points to neurobiological mechanisms or cognitive functions and other things to explain how we can sense intention or emotional residue or other fancy words that just mean vibes, dude. When my son was two years old and would be playing with a group of friends, the moment any of them began to pair off or lose focus, he would raise his hands and say, I all done. Then he would go to his room and relax with the film. Usually the Lion King, he found the Little Mermaid misogynistic. But the point is that even at two years old, we can sense the shift in a group. And it bothers us. As you can see by his expression in this photo taken shortly after a Lego group dynamic had failed. But every day, in every city, in most companies on Earth, we squeeze ourselves into conference rooms for workshops, and brainstorming sessions. And we completely ignore this group dynamic instinct, not to mention our individual creative thinking styles. Now, how many of you can pull up a memory of having been excluded from a group, either as a child or even more recently? It's a visceral memory, right? You can feel it. Now, how many of us will admit to having excluded someone from a group for any reason other than that person's own well-being? Yeah, really? Well, those of you who just raised your hand are excluded from this hall. Those of you who have never excluded anyone can stay, both of you. We all know the sting of being left out. So why is it still such a big part of our socialization? Indeed, a driving force in our schools and companies and politics. Well, I believe it's partly due to this sense of belonging we can get when we are exclusive to a group. We're able to suspend compassion for an outcast in order to feel like we belong. Abraham Maslow placed belonging as the third most basic human need, just above food and security. And belonging to a group was essential to the survival of our species. Before us humans became human, conscious, self-aware, socially sophisticated, like the need to belong, that instinct to exclude others was also essential to our survival. Our ancestors instinctively knew when to banish a member who threatened the tribe by being overly aggressive or contagiously sick, or they simply didn't help gather or hunt for food. Now, there's an easy teenager joke here, but I'm reading the room. <laughs> Exclusivity and other fear-based instincts obviously served us well, or this hall might have been filled with lions <laughs> discussing ideas worth spreading. But now, most of us are conscious, self-aware, socially sophisticated, not to mention more locally and globally interdependent than any time in history. So this instinct turned tendency to exclude one another not only doesn't serve us anymore, it threatens our very existence. Exclusivity is our new line. So here we are in our conference rooms for brainstorming sessions based on organizational charts. We're communing with one another in formats that are tired, counterintuitive, indeed harmful, because we often ignore this instinct and our individual creative thinking styles. 
So besides binge watching TED Talks on Netflix all weekend, what can we do to get out of this dysfunction? Well, there's a very exciting revolution that's been going on in the software industry, which is based on principles that I believe we can embrace and incorporate in other areas of our life. Now, I'm speaking of open source code. This is when a company releases the source code of a product to the public, to anyone, to build on, and hopefully to innovate. Now this obviously flies in the face of the long-held corporate ethos of exclusivity. But with the enormous success of products and companies like Ubuntu and Firefox and Chrome and Android, this ethos is shifting and fast. Suddenly, fear and exclusivity are no longer as motivating or as potentially profitable as sharing and inclusivity. So to get out of this dysfunction, I get into what I call open source mode. It's a strategy. It's a state of mind, really, based on the tenets of open source code, but applied to my operations as a creative director. Idea generation, group problem solving, and the strategy is this. Include everyone, give them access to everything, and then gather and share anything. Simple, right? But because so many of our colleagues and classmates are still locked into this exclusivity ethos, the tactics of that strategy can be a real challenge. It requires us to rise up against some of the most embedded and time-honored practices and behaviors we have. I have a, a slew of these tactics that I use under this strategy, but Ted has wisely determined that 18 minutes is the optimal time for sharing and grasping ideas. So you can read about more of my ideas in my forthcoming book, 19 Minutes, stuff that I couldn't fit into my TEDx talk. <laughs> so today, let's focus on just one, the brainstorming session. True story. Years ago, I was invited to an exclusive brainstorming session to help a client come up with ideas of how to sell a lot of ads in a short period of time. Now, many of you are probably familiar with the rules of brainstorming, two of which being there's no such thing as a bad idea and don't judge any ideas as they're coming through. Well, in my excitement, I actually blurted out the first idea. What if we discounted ads for your preferred clients for a short period of time? Well, the brainstorming facilitator looked straight at me and I kid you not said, bad idea. We're already undervalued. Next. Well, I, I shut right down. And so did most of the group for fear of being judged by the very person who just read us the rules of brainstorming. Now that the brainstorming facilitator made three critical mistakes. In the first minute, she broke two of the primary rules. Before the session began, she made it exclusive. And here's where that parable of the monks and letting go of old ideas comes into play. Before she was even born, the brainstorming technique was scientifically proven not to work. It was introduced in the late 40s as a group attack on a single problem. In the late 50s, Yale University conducted the first empirical test of this technique. 48 students were divided into 12 groups and given a series of creative problems to work on. As a control, 48 other students were given the same problems to work on alone. Well, the solo students came up with almost twice as many ideas, and a panel of judges deemed them to be more feasible and effective. So the brainstorming technique seemed to make each individual less creative. Now, I'm not suggesting that creative group activities are a waste of time. But when we conduct them like this and exclusively, we're ignoring the science. We're ignoring our group dynamic instincts and our individual creative thinking styles. Here's what a brainstorming session looks like in open source mode. First, change the name. Rebranding sheds old expectations. I call them open source sessions, and here's how they work. One, include everyone. If the goal is to come up with great ideas that help everyone, then Letting everyone in to help is the first great idea. Don't limit participation. Invite everyone from the CEO to the receptionist to the janitor in. Title and position do not determine ability. In fact, sometimes, unless someone knows about the problem or your company or the history, the broader the solutions may be. For instance, the governor of California appointed me to the board of geologists. Did I mention that I am a creative director in broadcasting? I don't know from rocks, okay? But the wisdom there was that I could ask some really smart people some really dumb questions. 
and prepare them for some really federal agencies. <laughs> Second, give them access to everything. In an email, state the problem that needs to be solved, include relevant links, research, initial ideas, and all the failed solutions to date. The more honest you are about what hasn't been working, the more people will want to come to your rescue. Now, in that email, set a date at least three days away to convene and share everyone's ideas. This gives people a time to find their most favorable setting, to be their most creative, whether alone or in a group, at work or at home. Third, gather and share anything. List all the ideas anonymously on a board, but allow people to defend or take credit for their ideas as you discuss each one individually. Now, vote on the top three or five, and then pass those on to an unidentified decision-making group. Moving the burden of the final decision outside the room keeps egos at bay, and actually serves to help the group coalesce as a single body, which is really the point. Now, while you have everybody in the room, ask them to consider their answer to one question. What skill or talent do I have that I wish more people recognized? The answer to this question unveils our bliss. It's what we wish we were doing more of or instead of. And coming at a problem from this angle adds a sense of responsibility to our creative process because we're coming at it from our expert frame of mind. Suddenly, everyone in the room is more qualified to be there. Now, the bliss question and the open source session are tactics designed to help a group get beyond exclusivity and to coalesce. But unless we embed that open source mode into our being, then like that brainstorming facilitator, we'll simply be reading the rules and not following them. So how do we embed the open source mode into our being? Well, there's many ways. Again, 19 minutes. But one technique that always works for me is a kind of aversion therapy. I have a set of memories that I can pull up of times when I failed myself, when I behaved or thought wrong based on fear or ego, and, and I caught myself. And that memory of the epiphany always brings me back to this open source mode. For instance, I was volunteering at a fundraiser for Promise Ranch here in Colorado, which offers therapeutic horseback riding to children with disabilities. As I was directing traffic onto the ranch, I noticed a young man leaning up against the back of a van. He was dressed in black, and his pants were tucked into his boots, and sunglasses on, a guitar slung around his back, and I thought, get a load of this guy. I mean, the band sound checked an hour ago. I knew he wasn't going on stage. Then I saw his group put their arms around the man who was struggling to walk down a road, as people with severe cerebral palsy do. Well, I collapsed emotionally. My judgmental mindset was crushed instantly by compassion. I got it wrong. This young man probably spent the better part of that afternoon dressing to be part of the scene on a night out with friends and to forget about his pain for a little while, and there I was judging him. I got it wrong. But I hold on to that moment because it puts me into this open source mode. And you know, it doesn't matter what we call it. Open source mode, strategic inclusivity, anti-bullying. What matters is that we get into this mindset as often as we can with our classmates and our colleagues and our neighbors. And be the kind of person that joins a group that helps a man in black down a road. Because the truth is, we're all a man in black struggling down our road toward a bliss in hopes of forgetting about our pain for a little while, maybe even getting on a stage. I all done. <laughs>